too hot to wear a funny hat. You're getting the Jason Statham look today. Speaking of being hot, I could even say it's steamy. And since we're talking about steam, Steam Next Fest happened recently. Great segue I did there. Good job, Citanium. And so today, I wanted to actually give you a rundown of the games that I played during Steam Next Fest, as well as kind of give you a little bit of an overview of what I thought of the whole thing. This year was actually pretty easy to figure out what I was going to play. One of the neat things uh, that they do in the tab for Steam Next Fest is they, uh, they tell you about games that are currently on your wish list. And uh, I already had a bunch that were on my wish list that now had demos for Steam Next Fest Summer 2024. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm playing those. And for the most part, that's what I did. Uh, there were a couple others that I found along the way that I tried. But for the most part, I was like, well, I already was looking forward to these, so give them to me. And so that was what I was really mostly excited about. Uh, at least initially excited. And I, I will get into that because I guess my overall impression, just to kind of like start this off, was kind of lackluster, to be honest with you. Uh, there were a lot of offerings there, but there wasn't a ton that really jumped out at me of stuff that I was really looking to play or that I was really excited to play. And in fact, a lot of the ones that I was excited to play, I didn't really have much interest in after trying out the demos. I think when, you know, the reality hits you of what the game is going to be and how it's going to function, it, it doesn't always seem as appealing. But there were still some gems, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. We're going to start things off with Aska. Uh, Aska is a survival crafting game that has, like, Norse mythology vibes to it, and you're probably already thinking, isn't this Valheim? And yes, yes, but there are a couple important caveats to this. Uh, in this particular game, you are building a village. This is actually the most interesting aspect of Aska, in my opinion. Uh, you are summoning more people to your village that are going to take on different tasks and set them up with assignments to work at like the wood camps or working in the farms and the fields and everything like that. Uh, you go out and do your basic harvesting and get your different tools and all of that is pretty standard stuff that you normally would think of. You also have some survival mechanics that you're probably going to be very familiar with the idea of food and water, you know, in addition to just your health bar. Uh, I found that the thing that was actually hardest to maintain was the water. And uh, then you start to realize that there are ways to mitigate that because there are like rain collectors and it does rain quite frequently. So this helps out a lot. Um, but there are some obvious things that you would assume you might be able to do that if you've played other survival crafting games, you'd be like, why can't I do this? Like you uh, get shipwrecked at the beginning of the game, and you're on the shoreline. You're, you, there's, there's a giant sea of water in front of you. And you learn how to make fires, and you learn how to cook food. Sort of. Some of it. But the point of the matter is, is that what would you normally assume you could do at this point? Learn how to boil water so you could drink it. You have a flask. It has water in it already. The normal expectation is that you can then interact with that water, set up a water purifier, or do that. Um, the game doesn't present you with that. The cooking is also not very satisfying. I didn't really know what it wanted me to do. In fact, I would find uh, different ingredients that I figured might be good for cooking. Eventually, I learned how to like fish. And I, I brought fish back, and I was like, oh, I've set up a spit, uh, I've set up 
uh, campfire and everything, I will put the fish on the campfire now that it is lit. And the game said, nuh-uh. You don't put fish fish on the stove. Okay, well, how do I cook the raw fish? I still do not know. I have no idea. I don't get it. What am I supposed to do with these fish? I'm not going to eat the raw fish. That would be a bad idea. Maybe it's in the full game? I hope. There's also some things that they set up in this that are obviously... Maybe they just shouldn't have introduced them. Like, they will introduce the idea of farming and a hoe and everything like this, but you can't actually use them in the demo, so you'll get seeds. But the seeds are useless because you can't use them in the demo, so why'd you introduce the seeds? I, I don't know why you did this to me. You, you, you started introducing mechanics to things that are not in the demo. Building an Aska can be a little tedious when you start out. You'll be able to put down a blueprint, and then you can take resources that you find, and you can contribute them to the blueprint. And this is a fairly standard thing that you've seen in a, a lot of different crafting games. Uh, including the idea of taking larger resources and stacking them where you're you're holding them purposefully and then taking them to their destination. Uh, I saw that in Grounded and Green Hell. You know, you, you, you get all of your logs, you, get, you can hold a few logs and you can take them back to your camp. Uh, the problem is, is that with Aska, they don't even let you stack it. They basically say, oh, you're holding a log. That's it. Nope, you gotta come back for all the other lo <laughs> A long stick? Nope. Yeah, keep it... Y you can only carry the one long stick. Sorry, kid. You're not that powerful. Which is funny because, like, it, it's kind of set up that you're, like, this strong Norse warrior, you know, at the stars. So I, I, I don't... Feels like I could do a little bit more than that. However, once you start getting people into your village, the benefit... Uh, is that you can then send them out to do these tasks. And uh, this technically starts to minimize a lot of the tedium by having other people in your camp. And then it's mostly a management of trying to take care of them. Uh, you will have raids of different enemies that will start attacking your camp. And they will try to destroy them for reasons. Uh, they will also drop some important supplies that you can use. Uh, you have, like, the zombie guys that will drop bone fragments, and you can use those. I did find it a little bit odd that, like, bone fragments are one of the things that can rot. B uh, they literally can expire. I get food. Food is a common thing. Bone? Interesting choice. Overall, I think the game has potential. Uh, I'm not really sold on it, but I think it has potential. And if they uh, if they flesh out some of these ideas, I, I, I think it could be a good game. I just really was not sold on it by the demo. Flintlock, The Siege of Dawn, was one I was looking forward to greatly when I booted this up. And I do have to say that it didn't really disappoint. I, I think that it is a strong competitor uh, for games that I'm going to enjoy this year. Uh, it is a Souls Light, as it dubs itself, and I get that, because it has a few Souls mechanics that you're used to. For instance, if I die, uh, all of my currency in the game gets dropped at the point where I died, and I have to go back and reclaim it. Okay, and there are standard points where you can log in, like a bonfire, and there are a few different types along the course of the game. Everything respawns, and you can use this to, uh, you know, upgrade skills. 
This is actually an interesting departure for Flintlock, is that it's really about upgrading your skills, getting new skills for a few different tech trees, uh, rather than individual stats. The overall concept of the game is, is pretty neat. It's um, sort of a fantasy game, but it's got piratey kind of elements. So you have a handy dandy Flintlock pistol, and you've got yourself a sword. So this is a, a neat kind of mechanic that goes into this. And in this world, your character is trying to kill the gods. And you get help from, like, a little cat dude who is also a god, but like a minor god, not a major god. So they set all of this up, and it's it's... Very nice world building very early on. One of the things that might register it as a Souls light game is that it definitely has more action-y adventure orientation in how it plays. Uh, there's more jumping around and using these little portal slings that your little god buddy helps you with to you know, go over long crevasses and, and traverses. And the combat is also supposed to be much faster and doesn't have a lot of, like, rhythm-based strategy, move around your opponent sort of stuff. It's more like, I gotta get in there, I gotta slash him a bunch, bunch maybe jump back, fire my pistol, jump in a few more times, okay, if I get, like, a few hits on them... I get another bullet back in my pistol, and I could I could run around here, and maybe I could fire at that, uh, you know, explosive canister. I have a bomb, throw the bomb, that kind of gameplay. And it actually works pretty well. There are still some strategic elements that you have to remember in the game. Like, for instance, that there are enemies that are armored, makes it much harder to actually do damage to them, but there are also ways to stun them, where you can get into break points, you can break their armor off, you can get away their shields, and there are methods that you can do to make this easier on yourself. One of the other really interesting things that I was not expecting going in is that you run across these villages. The villages have been taken over by the monsters. And you go into the village and you start taking out monsters. You need to get to the head bad guy, the boss of the village. You defeat the boss of the village. The whole village is restored. And there are people there. And there's a shopkeeper and you can get side quests and stuff there. So it's like you're rebuilding this world in the same, you know, landscape of actually exploring it. Like, a, a neat concept. You get to do that a few times in the demo. Uh, and also explore some alternate paths. Uh, uncover some little secrets and, and doodads. And you also get to access places by learning the acrobatics that you find out about in the game. I think that it has a lot of potential. I believe that this is based on the comic book series, Flintlock. I'm pretty sure. I don't know for certain, but I am pretty sure. And I remember hearing about that way back when, uh, like, Dom Perry would tell me about it. And I thought that sounded like a pretty cool idea. And seeing it here made me remember, like, how cool that world really is. And so to see something like that on on screen and to play it was a, a real joy. Plays real well, very smooth. Uh, and it's coming out very soon for anyone who's interested. Goblin Cleanup is the most unique game that I played. There are a lot of games that are going to be on this list that are going to be in genres that I'm very familiar with. Goblin Cleanup is definitely a new one by me. And the concept is kind of great. Heroes run through these dungeons. We're all familiar with this trope. But what happens after the heroes are done raiding a dungeon? And they're gone. Well, obviously, 
you need a little goblin maid to go into the dungeon and reset everything. Mop the blood off the floors, clean up the meat piles that were left behind, reset all of the loot, rearm all of the traps, put the furniture back in place, and they made that game. You go into a dungeon that is still a dungeon with traps and everything that you have to avoid, but your goal is to fix the dungeon so that when the next hero decides to try their luck here, it's set up again. You use mimic chests, and you can you can hold on to them, and you can use it to, like, eat meat chunks that are in the world, but you also have to be very aware that if you stand in front of the mimic chest, it will eat you. There are swinging blades, there are, are laser eyes, there's all sorts of things that can kill you, and you get killed with one hit and revived at one of the checkpoint places that you've you've designated around the landscape. As far as I can tell, you have unlimited lives, but it, it does make it very clear that you are not immune to damage in this world. The general concept is that when you enter one of these dungeon areas, there is a number of things that need to be reset, a number of blood splatters that need to be cleaned, a uh, number of things that need to be re-energized or powered up or powered down, and so you've got this checklist and you have to do all of that and see how much you can, and eventually, you know, when you're ready to finish, you finish up and hopefully you've completed everything on your checklist and you get experience points, and if you've gotten enough, you can unlock the next dungeon and the next dungeon and the next dungeon after that, and they have different challenges in them as you go through. I really like this game in concept. The unique aspect of this game and what it was trying to do was a blast. Because you could tell that they were really thinking about, like, that aftermath. It, it's like crime scene cleanup or something like that. But, you know, it's literally the dungeons after war. It, it's just, who thinks of that? It's great. In reality, the majority of the game is me just trying to avoid traps so that I can put a slime on a pitchfork so that my slime mop can mop up more blood off the floors and try to go around this dungeon without getting myself killed, trying to find all the blood splatters so I can complete my checklist. To be honest with you, that starts to become tedious pretty quick. I can see where this would be a lot more fun as a co-op experience. And I'm sure that that was the idea, is to make it a, a co-op experience, not really a single player, so that you and a bunch of your friends are, like, running around this dungeon, like, oh, what room are you in? Oh, no, you just got hit with the with the crossbow trap. Oh, you're, you're stupid. And, you know, I, I think that that would be a lot of fun. Maybe that would be something to try. Uh, but as far as a single player experience, I, um, I was like, yeah real cool idea but in practice i i now feel uh frustrated that i don't know where the rest of the blood splatters are and i'm probably going to become a blood splatter again if i keep walking through these traps death grip is what episode one racer would be if it was around today uh, if you remember Star Wars Episode One Racer, it was a, a really fun game where you got to do the pod racing scene. They made a bunch of courses, and you, you got to go around in a bunch of different pods. Death Grip tries to re-energize you with that, and brings that back into a, a new era. It does a pretty fine job of it, actually. Uh, I can't say that it's necessarily as big or innovative as that game was, 
Uh, but I think that overall it, it did a very good job. There is unfortunately one thing that Death Grip is going to have to contend with, uh, which is that the same week that uh, it was releasing its demo for Steam Next Fest, uh, Epic Games had their free game. Uh, it was uh, Redout 2. And and Redout 2 is like F-Zero, but not F-Zero. It's new F-Zero. And this is a very similar genre of like that ultra-fast sci-fi racing game. And and Redout 2 is a, is a pretty good game, too. So it's possible that a lot of people might have just picked that up as a free game and might not uh, bother so much with Death Grip when it comes out. It is kind of a shame because, I mean, a lot of the mechanics are basically just lifted right from Episode 1 Racer. Oh, I can flip my vehicle up on its side. Oh, you can drift? Go figure. Oh, I can repair my pods when they when they hit things? No. I can't imagine. But it's not a bad formula, and it's also not a bad genre to try to get into. Uh, Episode 1 Racer, it's been like over 20 years since we had that game. And uh, there hasn't been a lot that has come along to emulate it. So good on Death Grip for trying. Duckside sounded like it was going to be fun. Uh, Basically, it's a survival crafting game, and you're a duck. Uh, yeah. Um, they they don't really do a lot with the duck thing, to be honest with you. You can fly, like, like a duck, and you do, you do have to, like, set down a nest, but you don't actually, like, the nest isn't actually your base. Like, you still have to build, like, a regular base. It's just that the nest has to be there. I don't think you even sleep in the nest. I don't think the nest is actually... The, it's just because you're a duck, so you gotta build a nest. So, there's that. And, anyway, um, then you go out into this world, and you need to do uh, survival crafting things, and you get like guns. Now you're a duck with a gun, and um, I got um, yeah, you sh- you're, you're you're cutting down trees, and you're using picks on rocks. And, um, so besides, besides the whole thing where you're a duck and you can fly and you're wearing an army helmet, this is pretty much as standard a survival crafting game I could imagine. And unfortunately, I wasn't really even all that engaged with the survival crafting part. Um, it, it, it's very... S- <laughs> It it feels very floaty when you're doing like the basic chopping of trees and and the the picking of of uh, resources and everything. Uh, it it doesn't feel as fleshed out as a lot of other survival crafting games. It kind of just lives on the novelty of but you're a duck and it's like, sure man, cool. Also, I didn't really like the idea that I had to be in public maps. This seems like the kind of thing that you could very easily do as just a single-player offline map. I didn't want to join a server. I didn't didn't want to be in a world where there were like 90 other ducks somewhere, somewhere in this big map. I didn't need that. I needed a smaller map where it was just me. I don't know why there's so many survival crafting games these days where they just... They absolutely insist, we're going to talk about another one later insist on having multiplayer maps. It's not necessary. Please stop doing it. Anyway, uh, so positives, I guess, uh, you get to be a duck, and the negatives are it really doesn't do anything else interesting. Vampire Dynasty is a game where you play a vampire, you come back to life, 
and you are very, very hungry, but you need to start making some moral choices. Kinda, sorta, not really. Because you are confronted very early on in the game with a guy that is tied up and needs to be drained of blood. And so you are presented with the option of, well, it doesn't seem right that just this random guy who didn't really do anything wrong is going to be a victim and I'm going to you know, drain his blood. Uh, or, well, supper's on, baby. You, you get that option. And I decided that, like, in the interest of being the starving artist, that I would say, oh, well, maybe I will spare the guy. Uh, and then I found out just how much of a false choice this whole thing was, because then another character that you know comes in and says, you've gone soft, and kills the guy anyway, and then you drink his blood. So... We're, we're not really setting up a lot of player choice matters in this game early on. Anyway, uh, the, the general idea of the game is not terrible. It's that you need to rebuild your castle. Uh, and you have a giant area that is at the top of a hill where you can build your crypt and eventually all of the other accoutrements around it to have like a big old vampire castle. There is also a town. Uh, in the town, there are a bunch of people. They all have jobs and occupations and things that they do, but they are also full of blood, and you're a vampire, and you might want that blood, but you have to be careful, because if they see you drink blood, your whole persona can be thrown out the door. And so to try and help emphasize this, Vampire Dynasty presents a, a mechanic where uh, you get to be two different kinds of vampire. You alternate between this stalker character, which is very fast and agile and strong, but is obviously a vampire. And then you have this noble, where you are not as physically capable, but you can walk amongst and talk to people. And maybe, maybe you could even try to suck their blood when they're all alone and nobody else is watching you. This could be very useful for you. Now, for me, because I'm not smart enough to do that, uh, I started to lose all of my blood because your health pool is directly tied to your blood intake. Um, I ended up uh, sucking the blood of somebody who I thought was alone, but apparently other people were by nearby. And then one of them ran away, and they told everybody else, and then a thing came up that said, Well, the village now knows your secret. There's nowhere for you to hide now. And... Um, so that was the end of that game. It's fun being a vampire, though. Rekka is a, a game that's supposed to be about, like, Slavic mythology and has some survival crafting elements to it. I, I really can't talk about this game very long because, frankly, I was so bored. Uh, I, I hate to say it, but I really was. I was so bored. There's just not a lot to do. There are a couple characters to talk to. You get the sense that you're supposed to be collecting certain items and that maybe you can make stuff with those items. But the first, like, three things that you're supposed to do are just collect this number of things for this person so that they can tell you how to do things. I mean, this game should have been far more interesting than that. You know? You've got the whole thing with, with, with like, Baba Yaga and the chicken house, right? Like, this should be pretty neat. The chicken house doesn't actually move. Should I even explain to you the amount of time that I spent picking up pumpkins from a field for a lady who said that she would give me some pretty sweet rewards, and then carrying them, individually, mind you, to a barn so I could just 
plop them on the floor. Too much time. That's the answer. Too much time. Reka Anotria, the last song, is a Souls-like that is definitely not trying to hide that it's a Souls-like. It is very much in the same vein. You have a uh, loadout, weight, uh, you have that same kind of combat that you're used to from Dark Souls. It, it does the same things with you getting status effects and having regenerating enemies when you go to bonfires. All the classics. Where Enotria does kind of like step out of that is in both the way that it's executed, a couple of the mechanics, and then also uh, I really feel in the way it's framing its world. Because in a lot of the Souls and Souls-like games, you'll feel like it has like a grim, dark feeling to it. Uh, the world of Anotria is definitely run down. You get that. But it's also like a sun-drenched Italian pavilion. Uh, it is just drenched with these warm colors. Even the enemies that you fight, it, it, it just, it has this life to it that you don't usually expect from games in the genre. And it works very nicely, I feel. It also gives you this idea of masks. There are certain masks that you pick up, and there are certain masks that you can construct. And the way you do that is by defeating enemies of a certain type. So basically, you can start to learn how to wear a certain mask, like you're putting on a performance, because you're kind of like, have no face of your own, by defeating enough of certain numbers of enemies. And these all kind of change the abilities that you have. They, uh, they, they give you certain benefits and bonuses. The other really unique mechanic to this, besides the masks, though, is that you can temporarily turn back time in certain areas. You, you have this ability to like summon the past, and by doing so, you bring back an image of the past that used to have a bridge here, so now you can cross over that bridge temporarily until you know, the, the, the time lapse goes away and the bridge is back into disrepair and falls. And this allows you to traverse certain areas and uh, gives you a few little time trials of getting over certain areas before time runs out. Uh, nice little idea. And also, I think thematically it works really well because it kind of shows that this world that is run down was once vibrant and fresh and fully functional, and that has not maintained to this day. Uh, and Notria, the last song, I think is going to be a good game. I did get to the boss at the end, and I almost defeated him once or twice. It didn't really seem like it was going to be that difficult. I I just got to the point where it's like, okay, I get it. I tried a few different combinations of weapons and I was just not able to get to the like the the last final blow and it was one of those things where it's like, yeah, if I ran through this enough times, I'm pretty sure that I could that I could do this, but also I have a lot of other things I'd like to play, and I'm not real motivated to, so I'll just call it, and maybe if I pick up the full game, I'll just defeat him then. Uh, so, I wasn't totally motivated to do that, but, but, uh, I thought that the combat overall was actually very engaging, and had a nice variety of different kinds of weapons, and how fast they attack, and that there were a nice number of different like spells and special abilities that you could utilize that really help to emphasize uh, player choice. So I think that uh, that Anotria, the last song, is uh, going to be a, a fun enough game, especially if you like Souls-like games. Ale and Tail Tavern is uh, sort of like uh, Stardew Valley, but you run a tavern, and it's in first person. And it's actually uh, not bad. It's not bad at all. Uh, you get to 
open up your little tavern, you get a whole list of things you could potentially cook uh, if you had the correct ingredients. But realistically, for the demo, uh, it was mostly about making barley porridge and uh, brewing up some ale, which is fine. You get the firm impression that there is a much larger list and that a wider variety of offerings can be beneficial to your profit margin. There's a small farm in the back, so you can start to learn to plant seeds and then grow your own ingredients from there. There's also some woods outside with things like boars and spiders where you could harvest different resources. Also, occasionally, just because they want to keep you on your toes, uh, like, undead zombies will attack your tavern, like, walk right in the door and just start smacking you from behind. So that's fun. Every patron that comes into the establishment will have a certain order that they want based on the things that you have said are on the menu, and then you have to provide it to them, and then they leave you dirty dishes, and then you gotta go wash the dishes up and see if you can replace them, because the next guy is coming in uh, to get his ale or two. Uh, sometimes the patrons will get drunk, and you need to shoo them away with your broom. Get out of a tavern, drunkard. We serve ale, but we don't want you to actually be inebriated here. Get out of here. And so you, you do that. Uh, a lot of uh, simple tasks that you have to perform, because you have to wash every one of the dishes, and then you have to get water, fill up the water buckets so that you can scrub some more and, and stuff. Uh... A lot of, like, the little menial, tedious tasks, sweeping up the floors, and, you know, uh, har honing in every one of your uh, plots for the seeds and stuff. And I have a feeling that this is also a, a game that can be played with up to four players. And so I imagine that this is supposed to be a lot of fun for... Uh, like, multiple people to play as co-op. Because then everybody can have little tasks, everybody can run the tavern together, and wouldn't that be a fun little little thing to do? I'm sure it would. There's also a leveling system, so as you level up you get access to new uh, options, and also different parts of the tavern start to unlock so that you have other rooms to work with. A nice little feature. It You know, overall, I think it's a fine idea for a game, very engaging, lovely art style, sound design, some quirky characters, uh, you know, uh, just a, a, a good, basic, cozy game that you could play as a co-op, and it's probably going to have a lot of life in it for people who, who like to just hang out with their friends. And do stuff. I, I think it's a great game for that. Um, I don't know if it's going to be as fun for a, a single-player experience. It's also going to be fun to see as much larger world where you get to go out and explore and see what else they are uh, they're they're cooking up beyond the the tavern itself. If you're going to get to go into like caves and go into the woods and do you know do all of those things, if there's a bigger world you get to explore, uh, that would be fun. Maybe even as a single-player experience where you can close down the tavern and say, "Go and adventure in today." That'd be great. Yeah, I'm sure as a co-op experience, that's probably what they're hoping for, is, is that's where the main gameplay is going to be. Blacksmith Master was going to be a layup for me, because uh, I knew I was going to like it before I even started playing it. And the reason I knew I was going to like it was because Untitled Studio had previously made Tavern Master, and I played a lot of Tavern Master. And Blacksmith Master is just that but instead of running a tavern, you are a blacksmith, and you make swords and spoons and things. That's what you do, and uh, the thing about it is that when it starts, you're just by yourself, and you learn the little mini-games that you can use uh, in order to, you know, pound out your iron and, you know, heat it up and, and put it in the bath and everything like that and make the individual pieces. But quickly you realize that that's just something to kind of keep you engaged in the early game because you're going to just hire people. And when you start hiring all of these people, you can have them do all of this. 
And so you hire your blacksmiths, you hire shopkeeps because you can open an actual shop with displays so that you can put different items out for sale. You hire assistants so that they can run and get ore from the town, bring it back, smelt it into bars so that your blacksmiths can utilize it, run all of the materials off to the carts to complete missions, run it to the stores. And so it's now basically a management sim, which makes perfect sense because that's absolutely what Tavern Master was. It was a management sim where you had different, uh, you know, people that worked for you and they had special abilities and then they would grow in level and then you could, you know, increase different attributes of things that they do and how you wanted them to act. And that is what this game is, except it's with blacksmithing. So automatic win. There's nothing about the demo that I didn't like, really. Uh, I think the only thing I could cite is that in the demo, at least, it would only allow you to have one quest going at a time. Which is annoying because I have certain blacksmiths that are tasked with just making items for quests. But there's this period where after they've completed the quest, now they have nothing to do. I would have really liked to be able to queue up or have the ability to have multiple quests. I imagine in the full game, they start you out with one quest that you can take on at a time, and then they expand that, because there's also, as as it looks like, that there's going to be multiple levels, and that you will go mining and stuff like that, and there's a lot of different materials that you can harvest and stuff. But in the demo, at least, as, even if I could just queue up a few that I wanted so that I would always know that the people working on quest items are working on something, would have been nice. But, uh, let's face it, I'm gonna buy it, so... I, they did their job. They succeeded. Untitled Studio, you succeeded. A Kimbot uh, is a game that I can best describe as We Have Ratchet and Clank at Home. That's not necessarily a bad thing, okay? Uh, because Ratchet and Clank is a really great series, and there's not a lot of other imitators out there at the moment. And once in a great while, you get a Ratchet and Clank game, and everybody gets happy. Ooh, Ratchet and Clank's here, and we're having fun. Akimbot says, well, we don't have the resources to make that kind of a game, but we really appreciate it, and wouldn't it be cool if you get to play uh, this this quirky character with a little robot sidekick, and you're going off kicking some robot butts, and you're on these like long traversing paths and, and some action set pieces, and you get some neat guns and stuff like that, and it does a fairly good job at that. You get your little action platforming set pieces, you get a few different types of guns. The thing about it is, is that I can't really tell you that the guns are nearly as innovative or creative or fun as the ones that you would see in a Ratchet and Clank series. The lead character does not have the personality or even an expression on on the character's face. Like literally, it's just all covered in metal the entire time because I think I think literally it is a robot. Uh, so it not can't be. Ex- as expressive as Ratchet, and even the little sidekick feels far more annoying than Clank ever could have been. So, it's not going to be that, but I think it tries really hard to be a fair enough imitation where maybe, just maybe, you might want to try it uh, just to see that kind of formula. The problem ultimately will be if you try this game and then you go and play literally any Ratchet and Clank game, you will never want to touch this again. And I think that's where a Kimbot is going to have some trouble. Because you could play any Ratchet and Clank game and go, oh, I like this much more. Uh, and unfortunately, a Kimbot doesn't really have enough of an identity of its own, 
or really unique mechanics of its own that warrant it as a replacement to to a Ratchet and Clank game. And so finally we come to Once Human, a game that I started having high hopes for when I first started playing it, and then less so as the game progressed. Uh, so Once Human is a game that is ostensibly a survival crafting game with these very big, almost like eldritchy kind of horrors that are populating a just decimated urban landscape. And it's kind of also has this feeling of Death Stranding, because at the very beginning of this game, you're like waking up in a facility, uh, some supernatural stuff is happening all around you, uh, it's, this, it's this whole, like, we gotta rebuild the world kind of feeling to it. Uh, but then it keeps taking inspiration from every other game, and I, I gotta be honest with you, like, it it was they weren't bad games to be taking stuff from because on the one hand like the way it looked and everything felt death stranding like but then you battle this one character that has a suitcase mimic head and kill him and then you can pick the suitcase mimic head up with your telekinesis like it's control and then you can fire projectiles out of the suitcase mouth at other enemies and i'm like oh we're going places now but then they introduce a mechanic where you can capture these, like, little paranormal creatures and take them with you. And now it's Pal World! So it was like Death Stranding, and then it was Control, now it's Pal World! Then they take you off to a sanctuary. You meet, like, the the uh mythical uh girl character again going back to death stranding it's it's hideo kojima again and they say you need to do survival crafting things okay now it's rust okay so now you start doing survival mechanic stuff and they say oh we're going to get raided by a giant group of the of the bad things and they've got a big bad thing with them get ready and so you got to get armaments you got to learn how to like use your bow and everything like that and get ready for an assault so now it's a tower defense game apparently and this giant creature comes out of the mist and starts to like wander towards you and you have to like shoot it a bunch of times with the with your crossbow that you just learned how to build uh and before before it dies and then you're safe but then you have to leave sanctuary so that you can go into the real world which is this dilapidated last of us looking landscape um where there's all of these zombies running around <laughs> <laughs> and also creatures that you can capture and you have to build a base and do survival crafting and you learn how to use guns and there's like mythical creatures I guess in there somewhere and man I'll tell you that first like 30 minutes of the demo I'm like what is happening this is everything this is every game that they rolled into this one thing. And that's wild, man. And then... Then the reality hits you. You get into the real world. Or the uh, 
broken down post-apocalyptic world that you're really going to be spending your time in. And you realize that this is a uh, this is a multiplayer game. This is going to be like a, a big multiplayer game where you have to be on servers with lots and lots and lots of people. And the game at the very beginning was really touting the idea of being able to have freeform building, you know, build wherever you want, do whatever you want. But there's a problem with this, as a lot of people are probably realizing. If you say, we're going to create a build anything you want, freeform, you know, base building mechanics game. Also, it's going to have like a hundred players in a server. You can already see the problem, right? You obviously can't build everywhere you want. Or pretty much anywhere you want. Because other players are already there. Either you're going to have every player building on top of each other. Or you really can't build anywhere near them. And so... I drop into this world... And they say, you could set up a base. Oh, sure, I, I guess I could. So I, I get out the base schematic, and I go to place it down, and it tells me, this is too close to a stronghold. Oh. Okay. Cool, man. Uh, sure, okay, too close to a stronghold? I, I guess, yeah, you wouldn't want it to be... Okay, cool. Well, let me let me try putting it over here. This is too close to a road. I can't put a base too close to the road? Well, that's going to be kind of tricky because there are roads freaking everywhere. It's an urban environment you drop me into. So what do you want me to do now? Okay, fine. Uh, I'll go over here. Here's a field. Oh, I'm sorry. This is uh, overlapping another player's camp. Well, then where the hell am I going to build? Let me just give you a preview. I, I had to go to the outskirts of this place to find anywhere, just anything, where I could plop down a building spot. In the game that I'm supposed to be able to have freeform building mechanics where I could just build anywhere. I really had to work to find a spot, and I didn't even like the spot that I chose, so that just colored my judgment on the rest of the game. You just get the feeling like the game wanted to do everything. E everything. And it doesn't really deliver. On that, I, I think m maybe a honed vision of this would have been would have been useful. You know, as I started the game, there's this questionnaire that they ask you, and it's it's about like things and features that you would like to see more of, or that you are interested in in this game. And my God, there's a list that they give you of like. What features were you really interested in seeing in Once Human? And there's like 14 different categories, and it tells you about like all of the different sorts of things from all different genres, it feels like, that they're trying to implement in the game. And I should have taken that as a warning before I booted this up, like, how do... How do these all, like work together because it seems like maybe they'd like to see pvp pve maybe they'd like to see pvp ve you know like player versus player versus environment uh but then at the same time it's like well do you like the idea of creature capturing stuff do you like the idea of leveling up stuff do you like the idea of survival mechanics do you like the idea of the action mechanics do you want like soulsy kind of combat do you like the idea of challenging boss battles in this game do you do you like the idea of looting oh i should have also mentioned this this has a color-coded loot system in it as well so it's also diablo uh it 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 take it's everything the game is everything, and yet, it kind of feels like nothing. 
It kind of feels like nothing. It feels like they tried to shove every popular game into one game. And that never works. I really hate to say this because I feel like there are more games that are like this. That that have this notion that if we just take every idea that's popular right now and we throw them together into one game, it's going to be the greatest game of all time. That's not how this works. There are some things that just don't work very well together, and you have to have a bit of a honed experience for a lot of these because you have to have an identity for your game. I came into Once Human getting very interested and excited for what this might end up being. And I left Once Human never wanting to play it again. The demo failed. The demo failed badly. I cannot stress that enough. I am sorry, but it is true. Actually, you know what Once Human is? Once Human is like if you had AI make popular video game. And so you load in the 14 most popular genres of video games. And you shove it into AI GameBot. And, and AI GameBot goes, here is your new game, sir, in like 10 minutes. And you play it. And it's got mostly, like, it, it feels game-ish. Like, there's a game there. Something's off about the whole experience. It feels very disjointed because it's taken it for 14 different genres. None of them feel as satisfying as they should be individually. But once in a great while, there's the weirdest thing you've ever seen pop up. And for a moment in time, you're like, wow, kudos. And that goes away very quickly because nothing's ever done with it again. <laughs> it's that. One, once human is what happens when AI scripts a video game. <laughs> you get you get a, a couple instances with suitcase suitcase mimic spitting out balls of energy at your enemies, and the majority of the time, it's. I need to craft better shoes of green quality so that I can sneak up on deer with my crossbow. Oh no, zombies coming! Better build another wall on my base! That is ultimately what Once Human is. It, it's a game where you have some bright shining moments of true unique interesting wild ideas meshed with a lot of other disjointed mechanics that don't work nearly as well as they should lumped together to try and create some kind of a hybrid that will just try to appeal to everybody in some way shape or form and it didn't work for me, I can tell you that much. I it, I was not happy, I didn't appreciate it, and I think this is the last time I'm going to talk about it. Um, but, man. I mean, on, on the plus side, though, the suitcase mimic that could, like, blast balls of energy at your enemy was... I so yeah that was my experience with Steam Next Fest Summer 2024 and I have to say that you know 12 games is about my limit uh, I definitely wasn't planning on playing that many at the start but then the few that I had started out thinking I was going to play didn't necessarily pan out as well as I thought so we just kept going <laughs> Uh, and there were more that were on my wish list by the end that I said, oh, I'll keep track of it. But uh, even though I had 
some time and I, I probably could have played more of these games i frankly just uh, started to get sick of it <laughs> Uh, there was a, a point where I was just like, do I really want to play another demo of one of these games? Even if they're ones that I really wanted to play or that I'm looking forward to in the future, I just ran out of steam. It's like, yeah, there'll be time. I'll get to it eventually. Out of the the ones that I played, there were 12 games. Uh, I I really had positive opinions of about yeah maybe five of them uh and there's there's probably like maybe two of them that i actively actively uh plan on on playing like uh blacksmith master obviously that's a go slam dunk great uh and flintlock siege of dawn actually i think is coming to uh game pass so i'm playing that definitely uh out Side of that, though, and maybe maybe Ale and Tail Tavern, if I had some friends to play with, because I think it's better as a co-op experience. But the the fact of the matter is, is that uh, there were some of those games that I thought sounded interesting. I still think could have a lot of interesting qualities to them, and hopefully will. And maybe I will play them in the future, but I wasn't real jazzed about them afterward. I didn't get excited about them after playing this. And the role of a good demo should really be to get me excited about your game. You know, uh, not just show me things the game can do, but you know, really get me excited. Like what what's really new and unique and interesting about your game? And unfortunately, a lot of them, as I probably made clear fell short of that mark this time. Well, I'm sure that you're tired of sitting around here in the steam vents down in the Citanium Mine. However, going back up to the surface might not be such a great idea. You know, it's very hot up there. Like, really hot. At least down here you're in a mine. It's relatively cool. We can all live underground. Curse the sun. I shouldn't curse the sun, though. The sun is my friend. Look at how much it's done for my wonderful bronzed skin. Wait. Hello? Oh. Did you go up to see my friend in the sky? Yeah. He never visits me down here. Curse you. Oh.